Shear forces and shear stresses are usually of interest uh, in situation when we have more than one part, two parts usually joined together via some sort of connector or fastener. So for example, bolted connection, riveted connection, or you have the screws or you have the adhesive or the glue that join two pieces of parts together and you are applying a force that acts in the plane of the cross-sectional area of interest. So we have seen a couple of examples before where we have, um, let's say, a C-clip that joins two of the beams. So this is one you know, C-clip over here. And if you apply a tensile force at the two ends, then this force T is experienced in the cross-section of the C-clip. So if I draw the C-clip a little bit bigger, Actual geometry is a little bit more complicated than what I'm drawing here, but this gives you a pretty good idea. Okay, and the same force of tension is applied on these two uh, teeth over here. Okay, so over here, if you look at the cross section of the teeth over here, then this force T is actually in this cross section, it's parallel to this cross section. And that gives rise to what we call shear forces and, and in turn they give rise to shear stresses. So the first question is how do we define the shear stress? So the symbol that we use for the shear stress is tau and that is given as the force, which in this case is T, divided by the cross sectional area. So the definition of the, the shear stress is similar to the definition of normal stresses. The only difference over here is that you have to identify the right cross-section area and you have to make sure that your shear force is actually acting in the plane of the cross-section. Okay, so let's look at the other example that we saw. So here we have um, you know, two beams. So that's beam number one, that's beam number two. Let me pick a different color. That's beam number one, beam number two, and this is beam number three, right? So what kind of loading you would have in this case? So let's say this is being pulled with some force F this way and this is being pulled with some force F this way, okay? So if that's the case, then the question is uh, what kind of uh, shear stresses that would act on this particular, you know, clip over here. And we call this actually an eye clip. This is called, this is called an eye clip, okay, the eye clip. So first of all, we can see that if you draw this eye clip itself, and you know, I'm just going to do a, a rough drawing over here. You know, it almost looks like a dog bone, right? So then you have forces applied over here. So we have in the middle, you have this force F applied over here. And then because of uh, the number one and number two, you will have the forces applied in these two directions, right? So let's say that force is also you know, uh, we can actually find out what this force F should be. So let's call it F over here and F over here, okay? So if that's the case, now we can clearly see that in the cross section of this, let's assume this is actually circular, even though I know we, we're not, it's not actually circular cross section, we can find out what the shear stresses would be. And so what we have to do is make a slice somewhere. So let's say we make a slice over here. Uh, and then based on that, we should be able to find uh, what the shear stresses should be. So if this force F, is acting this way, then clearly this cannot be F and F. This would have to be F over two, and this would have to be F over two. So if you make a slice, let's say here, okay, which means we are just looking at this part. So let's draw a free body diagram of just that much. Then we know that we have a force F by two acting that way, and that means force here should be F by two as well, okay? Just for it to be in equilibrium. You could have picked the other uh, part as well, other piece, and it would give you the same result actually. So let's say we pick this portion. You can make a slice anywhere you want. So I'm going to draw this again for the bottom part. And I've got, uh, uh, what, have, what have we got? So we got F over here, and then we got F over two over here. Okay, and we're looking at what the force here should be. So clearly over here, because this is F, this is F over two, then let's call it P. So then we know that P should be equal to F over two for it to be in equilibrium. So at every one of these cross sections, wherever you cut them, wherever you cut them, the, the force, uh, shear force is F over two, okay? So if you know this force F over here, you actually know that the, sh the shear force in the cross section is actually F over two only, because you have actually two beams over here which are taking the load. So in this case, 
what will be the shear stress? The shear stress would be F over 2 divided by whatever the cross-sectional area of this is, okay? So if let's say this is circular, then that's D, then the area here would be equal to pi D squared over 4, okay? So that's how we compute the, the shear stresses. So let's do an example. So you will recall that when we discussed the normal stresses, we had a plate and we had another plate that was joined to it via a bolt. So we had a bolt that actually went through, you know, a little hole through these plates. And then we had nut that sort of tightened it, right? So that's what we had. Now in this, in that case, we actually tightened the nut and as a result, when we drew the free body diagram, let me choose a different color. So this is my bolt head and that's my shank for the bolt. Okay, we had the tensile force, you know, acting at the two ends of this bolt, right? Now that gave rise to different normal uh, stresses in different parts of this bolt. So if we were looking at this cross section over here, we knew that uh, if you draw free body diagram of just this part, we basically had the tension acting this way, tension acting that way. So sigma was equal to tension over A. So if you knew the diameter of this, that was tension divided by pi D squared over four. Okay. Now, if you were interested in the normal stresses in this region over here, so let's say this cross section, normal stresses, normal forces pointing uh, in a direction perpendicular to this, the plane of this cross section, then the sigma, let's call it sigma prime, in this area it was sigma prime, is equal to the same tension T, but now it is distributed over a larger area, so the area of uh, this cross section, and that's let's say equal to pi D prime square over four. So D prime is a D prime is the diameter here, and the D is the diameter here, okay? So the two are different. So in this case, the tension is the same, but this is pi D prime square over four, and clearly D prime is larger than the D, so sigma prime would be less than sigma in this case, right? And that was something that we did before with the normal stresses. Now the question is, how could you have the shear stresses acting on this bolt? Now for the shear stresses to act on this bolt, the loading condition would have to be changed. So instead of a, a tensile force, essentially what you would do, it, do is you would pull these two plates in the opposite direction with some force. So let's say this force is F and F that way. Okay, now this force would have a tendency to slice the bolt in the cross section, right? So if you draw the free body diagram of the bolt again, then what kind of forces do we have? So the top plate, let's call it plate one, this is plate two. Plate one is pulling the bolt in this direction. So we have the force F acting that way. And the plate two is pulling the bolt in the opposite direction. So that's the force F acting over here. So you can clearly see that this force F over here is in the plane of this cross section, right? Now if I make a slice anywhere, so let's say I cut a slice here, and I want to see what kind of shear stresses exist at this cross section, then I can pick either the lower side, so either I can pick the lower side, this side to draw free body diagram, or the upper side. In either case, we'll get the same result. So let me pick the lower side. So the lower side looks like this, and uh, I have the force F over here, which means that the force at the cross section here should be F also, right? And that means now I can write my shear stress, that would be F itself divided by the cross sectional area, which is F divided by pi D squared over four, okay? So computing the shear stresses is really just a matter of identifying which forces are acting on the part of interest, whether it's a connector, like a bolt or a screw or uh, some sort of adhesive or one of the clips that you have in the snappy exo kit, uh, you should be able to compute the shear stresses. Uh, now, some of you may be thinking, what happens to the stress versus strain plot if you have the shear forces, okay? So you can draw similar kinds of plot between tau and epsilon, okay? So you can do that again. So if you do that tau versus epsilon, you might get something similar as what you got before for sigma versus epsilon, okay? But we will not worry about that, except to say that we will have what we call the sigma, uh, we will have what we call the sigma for the yield in shear, and that would be indicated by sigma sy. So this is the yield stress, so yield stress 
in shear. So what would be that point? That would be somewhere here, right? So this would be, uh, no, let me not call it sigma sy, but call it tau sy. Call it tau sy, okay? All right, so that's tau sy over here. Similarly, you could have tau su, which would be the ultimate stress in shear. So that would be basically you know, this point over here, tau su. Now let's do another example. This is the example of the wire cutter that I was showing you before. So let me draw the wire cutter. And then I have a pin joint over here. Okay, so this is a pin joint right over here. So that this allows a relative rotation about this point. Let's call this point B. And I have a wire here that I'm trying to cut. Okay, so I'm going to apply my forces over here and over here. Let's say this force is equal to 100 Newton. All right, and what I want to know is what are the shear stresses in the wire that's over here we could have also asked this question what are the shear stresses at the pin at point b okay so what are the shear stresses in the wire so first of all what are the forces acting so let's draw free body diagram of the wire so i have my wire over here all right so it's going to experience the force so what is that force so let's say this point is a this point is c over here okay so we need to know something about the distance between A and B. So let's say from here to here is, I don't know, we'll call it uh, five centimeter. And then from here to here is, let's say 15 centimeter. I'm just making up these numbers so that we can do some numerical calculations. Okay, so if you draw a free body diagram of one of the, uh, the one side of the plier, so let's say we're looking at the lower side. Okay, so then we have the force of 100 Newton here, that's point C. That's the point B, so we have reaction, Bx and By, that's because it's a pin joint. And then um, the, the upper part is going to push the Y in the downward direction. So here the force, let's call it F sub A, would be acting that way, right? So I'm interested in the force Fa. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll take the moment about point B. So that would be sigma MB equal to zero, assuming this is an equilibrium. So that would be Fa times five, and that's negative, plus 100 times, 100 times 15, right, equal to zero. So Fa would be equal to 100 times 15 over five. So that's 300 Newton, right? So that's 300 Newton. So actually there's a sort of a magnification of the force. You only apply an input force of 100 Newton with your, with your hand, but the magnified force at the wire is 300 Newton. And you want it to be magnified because, you know, the wire may be very tough to cut and so on, right? So you've got some force magnification or what we call mechanical advantage in this case. So the force on the wire itself is 300 Newton, okay? So that's the force. So if you if you draw the free body diagram, you know, looking, you know, let's say you put your eye here and you look in this direction, you will actually be seeing the, your wire this way, right? You'll be seeing the wire this way. And this is the force F applied by the upper part of the jaw. And this is the force F, same F applied from the lower part of the jaw, which means if you make a cut anywhere, the shear force at this intersection at this cut would also be equal to F, right? Which means that the shear stress would be F divided by the cross-sectional area, which is equal to 300 divided by, now I need to know the diameter of this. So let's say diameter is equal to five millimeters. So that would be pi uh, D, which is five into 10 power minus three square divided by four, pi D square over four. So let's see what that number would be. Let me crunch in these numbers in my calculator and see what we get. So I get 1200 divided by 3.14 divided by 25. And that comes out to 15.28 into 10 power six Pascal. So it's nice that I have a 10 power six factor here. So that'll be 15.28 mega Pascal. And that's your shear stress uh, in the, in the, in the wide A. Okay, so if somebody said, give me the shear stresses acting in, in pin B as well, you could find that too. All you would have to do is now take the moment about point A being zero 
and this analysis will give you the force at B, which is what? Which is actually B sub Y. B sub, B sub X would be zero because there are no forces in the X direction, right? So from sigma F equal to zero, you will actually get B sub X is zero. But uh, from, from this analysis over here, at B, which is same as basically BY, you will get that. And then once you have that, you will again apply the shear stress formula. So that would be BY divided by the cross-sectional area of the pin at B. Okay, so that's a simple way to compute the shear stress.